Hello, my name is George Williams. I'm the Dean of Law at the University of New South Wales, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to our first ever virtual legal hour. And uh, of course, with the current restrictions around the country, we're delighted to welcome so many of you from your homes and well, likely just your homes at the moment, given the quarantine we're facing, to join us tonight. We've had over 450 people registering, and this has attracted enormous interest in our great panel. So we're delighted that we're able to hold this event and to do so in such an exciting and innovative way. Before I continue, I'd like to acknowledge the medical people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which I'm speaking to you today, and also acknowledge their elders past and present. In doing so, I'd also like to say thank you to our many alumni who are joining us tonight and others who would like to hear this conversation involving three of Australia's most senior media professionals. When we looked at holding this event, we felt that this was a topic that needed to be discussed now. We couldn't have quite anticipated it would be quite as topical as it is tonight, given the recent High Court decision last week, and indeed given some of the enormous pressures that the media is under to report COVID-19 and the quite remarkable restrictions that are being placed upon our everyday lives. Given that, I'm really delighted to say that we've got a stellar panel tonight. Um, UNSW Law is really proud of the alumni that we have. We have people who now are on the top echelons of the media, of government, in fact, around the world. And that's consistent with our status as being one of the very best law schools in the world. We're ranked 14th in the world amongst all law schools. But when it comes to the media, there's a really special connection between UNSW Law and our alumni. It might be because we've had such a strength in media law for such a long period of time. It might be because we really ask people, our graduates, to be a bit subversive, to look for different careers, to look at ways of changing the world. And being a journalist or being in the media offers such a wonderful way of doing that. But one way of us showcasing that is to look to our alumni, to really celebrate the people that we do have who've reached these senior positions. And so I'm proud to say tonight that we do have some really senior, influential people within the media who are our graduates are going to talk to us about this really important topic of press freedom. I'd like to introduce tonight Connie Carnabucci, who is the General Counsel for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, Nicholas Gray, who is Managing Director of the Australian, New South Wales and Prestige Titles of News Corp Australia, and Hugh Marks, who is the Chief Executive Officer and Director of the Nine Network. And I'm sure you'd agree we could not have asked for a better panel of senior media executives than we have tonight to discuss these issues. So the format of tonight is that uh, I've got some questions that I'm going to ask the panel. It's going to be free flowing and interactive. I've also got some questions from members of the audience who have pre-submitted those. I'm sorry that we can't in person ask for a show of hands tonight. We've got questions though that I'm looking forward to asking on your behalf. And these are questions, of course, about one of the big topics that we've been engaged with over now for several years. And that's the topic of press freedom. Is the press free in Australia? Are the restrictions appropriate? Should journalists have rights to speech that others in Australia don't have? And this debate follows on from a raft of national security laws that in many respects go beyond what we see in other parts of the world. We've seen in Australia the possibility of journalists jailed for public interest journalism. We've seen defamation laws leading to very large payouts. We've seen now the collection of metadata where every Australian journalist or not can have their personal mobile information collected and accessed by agencies and the like. New secrecy laws, new espionage laws, and of course the holding of trials in secret and the proliferation of suppression orders. Now much of this until recently was hypothetical. We had laws on the books, but there was never really a sense they might be used. After all, why would a democracy start using some of these more draconian measures against our journalists? But that changed last year in June, when of course we saw two raids upon two of our more, of our more prominent news organisations. And that really opened people's eyes to the possibility that these aren't just hypothetical measures, these are measures on the books that we can expect to be used. And that's why this has become such a sharp debate about just how free the press is in Australia. So I'm going to now turn to our panel. I'm going to start with Connie from the ABC. And Connie, as the General Counsel, I'd like you to give us a sense. What was it like on the day of the raid on the ABC last year? What was your involvement when the police arrived and uh, what did you need to do in response to when they turned up? Well, George, I guess uh, the place to start from is to say there was no playbook for what happened on that day. And I think initially there was a, a sense of disbelief that this was actually happening to the ABC. Um, as fate would have it, I was actually off site that day at an ABC board meeting. Uh, so I had to uh, inject myself into the process remotely, which uh, certainly added a degree of complexity. Um, but the uh, charge was led on the ground by Michael Rippon, one of my senior litigators, um, 
and he was ably assisted by one of our other litigation lawyers, Kia Daly. So you will have seen their images in all the footage. And my role on the day was really to do three things. Firstly, to very quickly help the team triage what our options were uh, and go to the MD with a set of options to get his directions on where he where he wanted to take it. Um, we then got the MD's directions and my job was then to really socialise that with all the stakeholders and implement the decision. Um, when we had to make that threshold decision very, very quickly about how to respond when the police were standing uh, at the security desk in our foyer. Not let them in? That you'd simply say this is a no-go zone for the police? Well, we were very mindful of our responsibility as model litigants um, under the model litigant rules, which apply to the ABC as a publicly funded organisation. Um, and in the end, as, as you may know, we took the decision to comply uh, subject to undertakings from the AFP that they would not access any material found until we had the opportunity to challenge the warrant. So all this complexity is playing out in the foyer in Ultimo, which is a very open, high traffic space for those of you who, who have ever been there. We're a 24 hour business. So at any given moment, there are employees walking in and out. We've got audience members arriving. We've got tour groups going through the buildings. We've got business partners coming to have meetings. And in a nanosecond, the phones were out. Uh, and people, as they were walking through the foyer, were filming the police. They were filming the people filming the police. Um, and of course, very famously now, John Lyons, our head of investigations and analysis, started live tweeting the whole thing, including the dialogue that was occurring on the ground between the ABC lawyers and the AFP. Um, so it, it was a very stressful moment. Um, and for days after, you could hear people having conversations in the lift saying, did you film it? Did you get it? Did you film it? Um, and I think it really attests to the fact that people felt that they had witnessed something quite remarkable occurring uh, on that day. Um, they remained on the premises for about nine hours. Um, there was, I think, a growing sense of frustration uh, as the day progressed, um, mainly because the story that was under investigation had been published years earlier uh, and there was, it was clearly in the public interest and it was not detrimental to national security. The public interest of those stories has never, ever been challenged. And, and front of mind, I think, George, really was concerned for our journalists who were in the centre of all of this and how they might be feeling. Um, and then you could sense that there was a building shock and, and a building anger um, rising. All eyes were on us um, and, you know, coupled with the raid on Annika Smithhurst the day before, there was a very real sense that what had happened was going to have very long-standing implications for investigative journalism in Australia um, and that, as you just said in your introduction, um, there were these powers that were there and were real and were capable of being wielded against investigative journalism and professional journalists going around doing their legitimate business. Um, Move to Nicholas now, Connie, um, because you, you mentioned Arnica, and of course, in the case of News Corporation, it, it was personal. I mean, that was the case of one of your journalists being raided uh, at her home. And so, Nicholas, I'm just wondering from your end uh, at The Australian, I mean, do you, how did this change things? And did you feel a need to change policies, approaches? Um, how did this alter how you went about your business once one of your own journalists had been raided? Thanks, George, and thanks for having me here tonight. As Connie alluded to as well, our first concern was for Annika. It really is a life-changing experience when your home is raided, um, a bunch of cops are going through your bedroom, your drawers, um, taking your phone. Um, it was an incredibly intimidating experience and, and so our company was immediately concerned for Annika. Um, and then, of course, that occurred on the 4th of June and then we, we, we watched what occurred um, at the ABC on the 5th via, uh, as Connie mentioned, John Lyons' um, extensive live tweeting of that. John's, of course, an ex-colleague of ours as well and, and I thought covered those events brilliantly on the day. Um, and at that moment, the, the, you know, the truth is 
we thought, well, how many more of these are there going to be? It, it later emerged that it was intended that there would be uh, a raid at Holt Street News Corp on, on the 6th of June, so the day after the ABC uh, visit, but that, that didn't end up occurring. Um, and, you know, as Connie says, this is matters of extreme concern for um, all journalists. And, and so our company has been very focused, certainly planning for should this event arise again, and, and clearly it could, because nothing has yet changed, um, but primarily focusing on, um, you know, building um, the, the Australia's Right to Know Coalition and advocating both in Canberra and through our newspapers and digital platforms about why these issues are so important and our concerns about the um, the creeping in, uh, in, in, uh, impositions on and, and reductions in press freedom. Thanks, Nicholas. And Hugh, you, I mean, you've been vocal in your support for press freedom, but of course, people are raided all the time. I mean, it's the job of the police to investigate crimes and uh, the police in many ways are simply doing their job. And I mean, what's so special about press freedom? And uh, I mean, why should we be so interested in some journalists from the ABC uh, being raided? Thanks, George. Well, look, um, press freedom's, to my mind, simply part of one broader thing, which is your personal right to be informed. So, and, and that's part of freedom of speech. How can you have great freedom of speech if people aren't informed? So it's not really a special privilege for the media, but it's a recognition that the media have a role to perform in making sure that debate is informed, um, that people, you know, can act on information that should be accessible to them, um, particularly when it comes to their governments and institutions. So, uh, you know, that right to know, the right for the community to be informed and the media's role of that needs to be, you know, very, very carefully uh, prosecuted and, and, and broadly prosecuted, I should say, because it's so important to our society. Um, and a lot of these cases, what you're seeing is, you know, really what they're doing is just they're worried about leaks and leaks. Therefore, what they're trying to do is intimidate journalists to say, well, if you get a leak, you're going to get raided. Well, you know, I, I don't think that's an acceptable culture for us to have as a society. Um, so that right to know, your individual right to know and the media's role in informing people of that I think is so important to the functioning of a proper society that it's really something we have to prosecute very strongly. Yeah, thanks Hugh. And Connie, you had the undertaking that you received about how the material might be used and of course you decided soon after to lodge a case in the federal court to challenge the warrant that had been used to raid the ABC. So, so why did you decide the case? Of course the ABC lost the case ultimately but why did you decide to bring it and what did you learn from that experience of trying to run this through the courts? Yeah, so just a point of clarification there, George, the undertaking from the AFP is that they would not access the documents that had been seen until we had had an opportunity to challenge. Um, so, you know, we had to determine what would be our grounds for challenging. Our view was that there were fundamentally important principles at stake here. Um, there was no question of not challenging. Um, essentially, we were defending our journalism and our journalists. And as Hugh said, we were defending investigative journalism in the public interest and the Australian public's right to know and to hold their elected representatives to account. So why did we go to the federal court? Uh, we went to the federal court because the received wisdom is that that is the appropriate jurisdiction to seek judicial review of the administrative decision to issue such a warrant. In fact, in their submission to the PJCIS, the AFP actually endorsed judicial review in the federal court as the appropriate form of redress for anyone who might be um, wishing to challenge such a warrant. And the nub of our case was really a very classic administrative law case uh, where we said the decision to seek and issue the warrant was legally unreasonable and that no reasonable person in the position of the AFP or the registrar would have made that decision if they had had regard to the importance of public interest journalism, the protection of confidential sources, which as Hugh said is absolutely vital, there is no journalism without confidential sources. And, and also the implied constitutional freedom of political discussion. 
So that was how we grounded the jurisdiction. Our challenge also went to the form of the warrant. We argued that it was too broad, that it was uncertain, that it failed to properly state the offences, um, that if the seized uh, material was obtained, it would not actually afford the evidence that the commission of the offences cited required. Uh, but as you say, we did not prevail. So what did we learn? We learnt a lot. What we learnt is that the current regime under Australian law for judicial review does not provide any comfort at all to the media when it comes to challenging the issuance of search warrants against journalists and the media. The judgment actually explicitly confirms that when considering such things, the court does not need to take into account the public interest, does not need to take into account the public's right to know, does not need to take into account the protection of confidential sources. And the court went beyond that and even said, even if the, val the warrant was invalid, if they were wrong and the, the warrant was invalid, they would exercise their judicial discretion to allow the police access to the documents seized in any event. And on this point, the High Court also came to the same conclusion. So the big takeaway here, George, is that the system needs urgent reform. And as Hu and Nicholas have said, um, it's brought us together as perhaps uh, unlikely uh, collaborators, but through the right to know, um, we have worked very hard over the last few months to put together very detailed submissions, both to the PJCIS and to the Senate inquiry, outlining how the current laws could be amended in a manner that would provide both adequate protection for the media and also allow the AFP to discharge its important function. In terms of the specifics of, of what you'd like to see, because you touched again on, uh, on the other case we had, which was the High Court decision last week, where actually uh, Annika Smethurst won her decision and the warrant was declared to be unlawful. So Nicholas, I'm wondering what you at News Corp make of that win. Um, do you see that as a vindication for the press, a significant win for the media in Australia? Well, Annika herself described it as a small victory. And I think the danger is that the immediate reaction in the headlines and social media was, hooray, um, you know, Annika has, has won that case. Um, but at the risk of making you blush, George, I think you summarised these issues very well in your, uh, in your analysis in The Australian two days ago under the headline, a hollow victory with a sting in the tail. Um, it's metaphor, that one. <laughs> that's right. Um, uh, and, and, re and really, the reason is because the High Court found that the warrant itself was defective, but it didn't really contemplate whether there's any right to press freedom embedded in our constitution. Um, it, it didn't go into that area. Uh, it uh, it did not give up, give Annika or News Corp or the broader industry any comfort that it wouldn't happen again. Um, and it didn't, uh, it, did, it wouldn't even give, the decision wouldn't even give Annika her data back. Um, so, so it was a very narrow decision, basically saying the warrant wasn't good enough. Um, so, um, and, and, and as, as I think Hugh alluded to earlier, um, the, the, um, the fact the fact of these raids, it it's to discourage journalists from reporting these stories, and it's to discourage whistleblowers from leaking to journalists to report these stories that are in the public interest. And you know, Annika had to wait three hundred days between the original raid and that decision. That's a that's a long time, and you know, that there's no question that has an impact not only on her but her colleagues in the industry. Um, and of course, it would make whistleblowers think two or three times. So, you know, I, I, I think, you know, in one sense it was um, a, a temporary relief for Annika, but it really was no more than that. And it, um, it, it's not, it wasn't progress um, with respect to the um, issues that Connie's outlined and, and the, the, the Right to Know Commission is, um, has been focusing on. George, yeah, thanks, Nick. Yeah, please, Connie. Just, just to add to what Nicholas has just said, 
the one thing that these two cases have in common is that both cases were seeking injunctions, injunctions to restrain the federal police from accessing the documents. And on that critical point, both cases failed. Um, now, the two, the two warrants will forever be entwined in the public's mind for a whole host of reasons, but they actually were very, very different uh, from a legal perspective. They related to completely different criminal offences and the grounds for challenging the validity of the warrants were very different. In, in Annika's case, the grounds for challenging the warrant were that the warrant failed to properly express the offence that was the subject matter of the warrant. So, so really, I think the key takeaway here is that they were very different warrants, different legal grounds for challenging validity, but the really common denominator is the failure to get that injunction in both cases to, as, as Nicholas says, to, to acknowledge that there is uh, a con implied constitutional freedom to political discussion and that in the public interest um, these warrants should not have gone forward. Yeah, no, and as you, as you say, that's right. I mean, if you look at actually why Annika won, she won because the police had a poor choice of words. In the warrant they referred to terms that were vague in the words of the High Court and that was a technical defect that led to her victory. But, um, yes, neither, neither case was a vindication of media freedom. And turning to you now, Hugh, and you have had the two decisions. I'm... I suppose there's a couple of things I'd be interested in your view on. One is, well, where does this leave the lie of the land um, as someone who has a large team of journalists at your disposal? And uh, the second part of that is we talk a lot about journalist freedom and I know you've advocated for reform, but who should be the subject of that protection? Are we just talking about your journalists or what about citizen bloggers, social media and others? So where, what's the lie of the land and just how far should any protection extend? Well, the lie of the land at the moment is uh, the government's being provided with a range of reforms that the media generally have agreed are the things that you know would be an appropriate balance back in the system to ensure that um, some of the things that have happened both to those journalists who were subject to aids in their organizations um, there's appropriate checks and balances right because no one's saying anyone should be above the law but everybody's saying there needs to be appropriate checks and balances all of those things are in front of the government. It's within their power to do, um, and it's within their power to do now. And, uh, you know, I know there are other more pressing matters on the agenda at the moment, um, perhaps, but uh, this is something that is relatively straightforward, which there would be bipartisan support and would really show, say from this government, you know, they want a culture of disclosure over a culture of secrecy. And I think that's an important statement for them. So it's within their power. Um, it is an interesting issue because I, I do I do recognise that there is a delicate balance here. Obviously, we're all part of media organisations that are regulated. We're all part of that regulation involving checks and balances on us as well, whether that be the Press Council in terms of publishing, the ACMA when it comes to television or radio. Um, again, if we step outside the lines, there are checks and balances on the media. and now. With private bloggers, and, um, areas like defamation are a lot more complex to manage in a social media context than they are in a traditional media context. And I think there's a nervousness uh, on the government's part on two fronts. One is um, nobody seems to be able to cope with the 24-7 news cycle. Um, everyone's response to that cycle is, shut down debate rather than embrace it and go with it as a free uh, society. Um, so that's one aspect. And, and another aspect is they obviously are nervous about perhaps social bloggers uh, being entitled to the same sorts of rights that we as media businesses uh, are, are seeking for our journalists. Um, and I think these are two quite complex issues, but there are solutions around them. And the solution, as I said, is quite simple. There are checks and balances on us as media companies. Therefore, that provides an appropriate balance to ensure that there are checks and balances on the other side. And it's pretty much as simple as that. So, Hugh, would that mean that you would see greater liberty being afforded to traditional media where there are those checks and balances and strong regulatory regimes, whereas, you know, private citizens who, you know, freelancers and the like are undertaking blogging, that they wouldn't have the same liberties or protections about sources because, you know, they're simply able to operate in a far more a free environment where enforcement is so difficult. Yeah, I mean, again, I think you have to look at the particular law reform and, and break them into individual ones. So, 
you know, when it comes to freedom of information, perhaps that's more difficult. Why should media be any more exempt than, than anybody else? Um, but what the government obviously would be nervous about is a deluge of freedom of information requests uh, from all over society if, if those laws were to be uh, uh, freed up. And uh, I don't know if you have ever filed a freedom of information request, but I looked at some that came through this process while going through the review and some of the, uh, uh, you know, documents that came through barely had any words that were left after they'd been redacted. So, you know, it's kind of a bizarre process. But when it comes to the core reforms, when it comes to things like uh, warrants and contestability of warrants, and when it comes to some of the laws that have been introduced that make journalism an offence, where we have to have a defence rather than being exempt and perhaps prosecuted if we don't operate within those exemptions, I think those are special things that, you know, media companies should be entitled to. And those are things that are easy, again, for the government to be able to, to do today. And Connie, you, you started to talk a bit about the reforms you'd like to see. I mean, do you have a, a clear list of things that you think need to be changed um, to fix the current state of the law? Yeah, well, um, the ABC, together with the right to know, we, we, we tried to make this as easy to understand as possible um, in order to have the best chances of achieving law reform. And We've boiled it down really to four points. The first one, and Hugh has mentioned some of them already, the first one is decriminalise journalism. And what do we mean by that? There are a range of uh, Commonwealth laws that currently criminalise the receipt of certain types of information by journalists. Um, we advocate the introduction of a public interest element into those offences so that the onus rests on the prosecution to disprove the public interest. Uh, at the moment, there is um, only a limited number of, of uh, such offences that provide a public interest defence after the fact, if you like, um, or in some cases, as you says, uh, the, the public interest is just not considered at all. So while this regime continues, journalists bear the, uh, the burden of criminal investigation uh, and proving public interest, and, and we really think that that needs to be addressed. The second area is really um, really the counterpoint, which is the decriminalisation of public interest whistleblowers. So again, uh, for example, under the Commonwealth Public Interest Disclosure legislation, uh, which is intended to protect uh, public whistleblowers uh, from reprisal, including criminal prosecution, those protections are not extended to disclosures of certain types of information which involve intelligence information or sensitive law enforcement information. So we, we say for each of the receiving offences that apply uh, to journalists, there should be a corresponding uh, disclosure offence which is tempered by this concept of the public interest so that we start to introduce some really rational checks and balances on this exchange of information, this vital exchange of information between journalists and whistleblowers. The third area, as Hugh mentioned, is contestability of warrants. Um, you know, our view is that Australia is out of step with international best practice and does not, uh, in not having a regime that uh, imposes additional restrictions on the issuance of search warrants against journalists. Um, and those restrictions, we think, would, you know, would reflect the importance of freedom of speech if they were introduced. Uh, interestingly, uh, some of you may have seen, and we were just discussing it before going live, that Australia this year has dropped five places in the World Press Freedom Index. We've gone from 21 to 26. So we feel we're a little out of step there. And then the last area is really breaking this culture of secrecy um, which has to do with the way in which the FOI, the Freedom of Information regime, uh, is, 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 is administered. Of course, the public does have the right to ask for documents from ministers and agencies, but the document classification practices need to be reviewed. Um, we think that the scope of available exemptions, which would then allow an agency to refuse disclosure, should be limited uh, to information which, if disclosed, would harm the public interest. Uh, we also advocate ongoing audits of the way in which agencies are classifying their documents. So really, in a nutshell, those are four areas. Thanks very much, Connie. And, and of course, there's a flip side to this as well, and that is not just what the rights of the media should be, but Nicholas, I'm keen to ask you about the responsibilities of the media as well, because the media exercises enormous power 
within our society. And of course, we see elements where the media might sometimes breach those responsibilities. We have the press council, for example, identifying breaches of privacy or a range of problems. I'm just wondering, I mean, how do you think we should deal with the problem of irresponsible journalism when it might arise? Well, clearly you have to strike a balance, George. There's a, a free press is incredibly important for society. You say with that freedom comes enormous responsibilities. Um, there, there is no privacy taught, but there are privacy protections for journalists um, or, or for people covered by journalists across um, a, range, a range of different parts of the um, uh, Australian law fabric, whether that's family law, um, uh, uh, surveillance law. Uh, uh, there's a, there's a, a, it, 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 it's impacted by a, a number of areas. Um, I think, and look, as you as you mentioned, there's the press council. There's defamation law, which is ripe for reform as well, and the council of attorney generals is looking at that because there are some issues there. So, you know, there's no question that um, media organisations need to be responsible um, and um, use carefully the, the powers that we have. But o overall, the um, the legislative um, or the, or the uh, array of legislation that's arisen over the last 10 years has created a lot of um, impositions on journalists um, and we, we believe it's gone too far. And I also want to follow up on a question about, I mean, where we might now go from here. And uh, Hugh, you've uh, mentioned that, you know, this isn't too hard in many ways. We're talking about legislative change. It's a well-travelled debate. I mean, the Right to Know Coalition goes back many, many years and arguing for a similar set of things to what Connie has already mentioned. Uh, I mean, why is this so difficult to get change across successive governments? So it's not just the current government we're talking about. And Hugh, do you think there's much prospect that at this time we might actually finally get some change um, to our laws in response to this debate? Yeah, look, I think there are some also, there are some good things happening at the moment um, from the government and, um, and and in that sense, you know, the, the recent decision by the government to introduce a mandatory code of practice for the social media platforms, uh, these issues are all tied together right? because journalism uh, should be a public good. It should be a public good that ensures that people are informed where there's an abuse of power, it's held to account. Um, you know, this is a public good. Uh, but there are challenges on our ability to do journalism. Um, obviously, there's been a huge shift uh, in culture. There's been a huge shift towards secrecy from government departments and institutions. At the same time as we've got a huge shift in the, you know, the ABC is publicly funded, but most of the other media organisations rely on commercial models, uh, whether that be ad revenue or subscription revenue, and those are challenges. So investment in journalism is very important. Um, so I think, you know, there are some easy law reform uh, suggestions for in front of the, uh, that deal with it. I would, I'm very encouraged by the strong steps they're prepared to take on the digital platforms uh, area. And and I want people to remember the, the, the issue on digital platforms is, is it's not like we're trying to save newspapers, right? Newspapers are just a platform. Um, like television as a platform. In fact, what we all do is we create content, in this case, journalism, journalism that's a public good. So, you know, I think there, and, and that journalism now gets distributed in multiple ways. One's a newspaper, another's a digital site, Facebook and Google uh, are also distribution platforms for journalism. I saw Mike Cannon Brooks saying the other day that that, that you know, was about uh, saving newspapers. Well, he couldn't be more wrong. It's about saving content. It's about saving that public good that's journalism. Um, so I think there's some encouraging things the government's doing, but again, there are some easy steps that they could take. Why are they nervous about it? Um, I just think it's a nervousness uh, about, and it's a nervousness of culture. You know, again, if you have a good culture, less leaks will happen. If you have a poor culture, leaks will happen because people will be disgruntled. So it's actually incumbent upon the government and the institutions to get it right not to take the easy route, which is to use laws and intimidation to try and shut down the media. 
you know, I, I have org leaks from my organisation all the time and I know that when we have a better culture, when the organisation is is more aligned, we have less leaks. So, you know, I don't go chasing, I mean, I do sometimes. Uh, uh, <laughs> probably, probably just in a random comment rather than uh, in, uh, turning around to someone's house and starting writing their underwear drawers. But, um, but again, when we have a better culture, uh, these things are more in control. So easy steps on law reform, but I am encouraged by the investment that the government recognises needs to be in journalism they're taking through that uh, digital platforms inquiry started by Rod Sims and the AFCC and having uh, decisions by the government. I am encouraged by that. And uh, of course, we've been talking about a culture of secrecy. We've been talking about national security laws, raids in aid of uh, identifying whistleblowers and the like. But in many ways, we're talking about ancient history too. I mean, the world has changed in the last several weeks because of COVID-19 and the pandemic we're experiencing. And uh, I'm just wondering whether you see any changes in government approach, how you think the media is handling this, and in fact, you know, whether you, any of your concerns are heightened or dissipated according to how we've seen the operation of the media over past weeks. I mean, Nicholas, have you got your reflections at the moment on, you know, how this debate might play out in this different world we're experiencing at the moment? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, this is the most extraordinary story of our lifetime i'd say i think it, i think you could easily argue it's the biggest world story since the great second world war and if you look at the data i think the uh it demonstrates that the audience engagement with the story has been incredible the 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 nielsen monthly um report uh that, that shows everyone's audiences for the month of march showed that all publishers broadcasters had digital audiences that grew very substantially, uh, some doubled in a month and um, most hit new records. And so that to me demonstrates incredible engagement with the story and the importance of um, traditional media choice so in reporting that story because, you know, again, it's The news and Lego masters. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's not all upside. Uh, for media organisations, as you alluded to, it's a very difficult time for a, a bunch of advertising categories. There's no question that um, people are engaging with the news and they need real-time updates on what's going on. I think you know, the government, both the federal and state governments, have been pretty proactive overall in, um, in the daily. Um, I, I was concerned when when Parliament wasn't going to sit until August, as many were, but um, I think that they're now saying they'll come back in May and um, I think that's incredibly important that Parliament continues um, because the media needs to scrut continue to scrutinise the government. I think we're just losing you a bit there, Nicholas, so we might get that connection re-established. I might come to you, Connie, if that's okay. I mean, what are you seeing from your perspective in terms of the role of the ABC at this time? Are there any issues that alert you to concerns with regard to media reporting or the like during this COVID-19 period? Yeah, not concerns so much as I think it's really, for me, um, confirmed in our minds that people turn to the ABC to really bring order when there is chaos. And, you know, we have had a period of very unexpected and rapidly evolving situations um, and anecdotally, people have been telling us, you know, that they've been managing their anxiety by dialing the noise down and just relying on ABC as their trusted source. I mean, I think the interesting thing is that during these types of emergencies, the media has to be really um, even more accurate and more measured than we would normally be. You know, a, as a statutory Commonwealth corporate entity, we, we have a statutory obligation uh, about the way in which we report our journalism. Um, but I think it's at, at times like this that those really important principles, good, strong, solid editorial principles um, come into play. And I think, you know, we've had a lot of experience with all of the work we've done with, um, you know, emergency broadcasting over the years for bushfires and other natural disasters in Australia. Um, the interesting thing is that there was some criticism of some aspects of the ABC's coverage early on because you might remember... Uh, we were doing some evidence-based reporting and analysis, which was pointing to the need for stronger shutdown measures. 
Um, and the suggestion was that, you know, the public broadcaster shouldn't be questioning the government in, in, you know, the government's response at a time of crisis. But actually the independence of the ABC is enshrined in our, in our ABC Act, our legislation under which we're created, um, and in our editorial policies. And really it's at these times that it is most crucial for us to function uh, in that independent way. Um, and I think, you know, the, the audience response to our coverage has been amazing, uh, overwhelming, actually. Um, yeah, thank you. And, uh, and one more question before we go to some audience questions. And uh, Hugh, is this a different time, perhaps, because, uh, I mean, we are seeing a, a genuine emergency here and uh, we're not dealing with just closing down whistleblowers or embarrassing government leaks. I mean, are we just seeing a genuinely different government response during this time that is more akin to what the media would like to see to actually facilitate free reporting? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a really good point. I think um, you know after a little bit of a stop start thing through the bushfires and some, some missteps and a and a kind of you know sort of initial kind of hesitancy in the in the context of the uh, the COVID crisis, I think you've seen the government really embrace transparency, honesty, uh, the flow of information, and and I think you can see. Uh, what's happening in terms of recognition of how well the Prime Minister and his team are handling this crisis. And uh, not that we should take credit for it, but it does show uh, that the public really responds to being embraced with access to information. And I think governments all should take note that it is this crisis and the way that the government has embraced the flow of information to the public that's built that trust between government and public. And, and, that, and that ultimately, that's what we're talking about in a lot of these things. So. Again, that's a really encouraging sign, and I, and I think um, talking to the Prime Minister, I think he recognises that you know that relationship um, has worked very well for him in this crisis, and his ability to actually achieve what needs to be achieved as a government. So, uh, very encouraging, um, and I think we as media, I think again there were some missteps early, some sensationalising of things. I certainly talked to our people on quite a number of occasions about what was factual and what was not. Um, I think it's been good for us as media as well. So, yeah, who knows? Out of all crises, uh, I'm an optimist, out of all crises might come great things. Um, but, again... What about, what about the scenario? Let's say that uh, we know the government can't tell us everything. If one of your journalists got a hold of a secret government document that, you know, showed some really startling modelling or that the government was riven on a particular issue, could you see them raiding you if you ran a story about it? Well, we, we, we quite often say, like, this is the problem. Everything in the past was classified under the protection of uh, uh, of national secrecy, or, or uh, you know, um, uh, and and we challenged the government to say to us, when have we actually disclosed something that legitimately would not be uh, that would breach those guidelines? And there is no example, no example that they could come up with. So I think the media has demonstrated a long history of. Uh, of, compli of, of proper compliance on, on uh, when it comes to uh, national security. And, and, and so I think, again, um, if we can build that trust, if the government builds the trust with the people, they get more comfortable with that environment, um, uh, then I think that's a better society and there's just some easy steps that they should take to change some laws. Uh, to It is easy. To Thank you. Thank you. And look, good to see some optimism <laughs> this time. So I've got some questions from the audience. These are questions that people uh, gave us uh, in registering for the event. Uh, the first question, Nicholas, I've got for you um, is a question, is the press in Australia already controlled by commercial owners? How can we really have press freedom post COVID-19, given the commercial control of the media? I mean, was it ever free? Can we even describe the press as being free pre-COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, most media is um, commercially owned, which is not unusual, although we have, um, as Connie's outlined, a, a substantial public broadcaster and indeed another one in SBS. Uh, I think also there's a misconception that there's three big media companies that, um, uh, that, that dominate to the detriment of um, all others. But if you look at the top 10 uh, news sites last month, according to Nielsen, which I mentioned before, there's seven different owners, media owners across that top 10, and that's not to mention Google and Facebook, which has outlined control distribution of more than half half the news. Um, 
So I think I think d diverse commercial ownership is a, a part of a functioning media, and that's what we have in Australia. Thanks, Nicholas. And uh, and Connie, the next question I've got is for you, and it's about um, this idea we've already discussed that everyone can be a journalist now. I mean, all we need is a social media account. Uh, and if we try and hold Facebook to account for hosting content, how, how would we do that? And I mean, is Facebook themselves now a media organisation um, or where do we draw this line? You've described four things that you would like to see happen. I mean, where do we draw the line between who gets the protection of those things and who doesn't, given many of these new players in the media market? Yeah, well, you know, we advocate a very principled approach. So the, 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 the golden thread, if you like, running through all of it is that the disclosure is in the public interest uh, and that it is accurate uh, and that it is impartial. So those are very high standards. Uh, but, you know, when we come to talk about the citizen journalist, well, anyone can be a citizen journalist. You know, social media has given us all the ability to engage in mass communication uh, however we might like to. Uh, there is a real risk of harm from bad actors on those platforms if they're not complying with that very principled approach. Um, and so, you know, in one sense, you, you might say, well, all people who are publishing, who are distributing content in that way, should adopt a very principled approach. Um, it's not as easy uh, because often these actors are hard to find. They hide in the shadows. Uh, they don't have registered offices with, you know, hundreds of people employed and editorial policies that are published on their websites and all of the imbalances, uh, if you like, that professional media organisations have. So certainly the enforcement issue becomes harder. Um, we're all still reeling from the decision in VOLA, which some of you may be aware of, where, you know, media organisations are actually being held responsible for defamatory comments posted on social media by third parties who are not controlled by those media companies and in relation to which they had no prior notice. Now, I understand that that appeal, in that appeal, um, the respondent has conceded that the organisations should have the benefit of what's called the innocent dissemination uh, defence. This is an interesting defence. It was traditionally applied to news agencies who were selling newspapers. Uh, with allegedly defamatory imputations on the front page. But, you know, they, the news agencies were not otherwise themselves involved in, in making those claims. So so that at least is, is one step in the right direction. But we're still waiting on the outcome of that appeal. So, you know, it's, it, it's a difficult issue, as you mentioned earlier. Um, but I think it, for me it comes back to let's take a universally principled approach. And so, Connie, would that mean that anyone, irrespective of commercial or government-backed background, if they're engaged in an act of journalism, should be entitled to the protections? But equally, of course, if they abuse those protections and they're held responsible, is that what you're saying, that you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a dividing line between different types of journalists? Well, well, in one sense, I think everyone should be moving towards that higher standard, right? The problem comes with enforcement because finding those individuals and actually getting a remedy uh, is difficult. So I think that, you know, those are policy issues that perhaps need to be, you know, further developed. Uh, but in our, in our mind, those four principles that we have been very clear about and very specific about are a great foundation to start from. Thanks, Connie. And, and Hugh, one thing that's been really striking over the last year is this really strong industry campaign. We've seen you know, people really with very coordinated messages across all forms of media. Um, I mean, where do you see that now playing out? I mean, has that now reached its conclusion or particularly if the government isn't prepared to make some of these changes, do you think the media can sustain the pressure that it's built up over, you know, the last year or so? Oh, look, we'll sustain it. We have to recognise that we operate in a different world at the moment. So, um, you know, there, there is some recognition that the government does have other priorities on their agenda. Um, but, you know, come the appropriate time, uh, we will be continuing to encourage the government to make these changes. And we have heard, I think, as we said last time we were in Canberra, um, some very positive uh, comments from the Attorney General. Um, so following through on that and making sure that some of those changes happen, uh, you know, is something that we will continue to do um, with, uh, with great gusto, as we will. And, yeah, there's, there's a recognition amongst all media 
um, that you know we need to have some sort of common platform when it comes to how the world is changing and again what it means for that valuable resource that is journalism um, and just on that point about Facebook you know they like to argue that they're just a smart pipe that they're not responsible for anything that they're a half billion dollar company um, you know we're also just a smart pipe um, but we have checks and balances so Facebook is a publisher and they have to take responsibility for what happens on their half billion dollar asset. Yeah, well, and look, we have a lot of alumni in Facebook and other organisations. So our next legal hour or happy hour, whatever we call it, we really will need to hear from our tech, our tech alumni as well on some of these issues. And Hugh, on it, please. We're not half billion. I got my, I got my zeros wrong. <laughs> yeah, half trillion. Half trillion. <laughs> George, can I add a point on that? The Vola, um, the 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 Vola decision, which Connie alluded to, which we're we're now appealing both both News Corp and, and Nine. Um, it's pretty extraordinary that um, uh, that people can make comments underneath an article posted by, um, uh, posted on the page of, uh, you know, whether it's The Australian or uh, any other site. Um, and those comments are actually very, quite very difficult to, to moderate. You, you need to be, uh, incredibly tech savvy to be able to remove a comment it's, and it's not a straightforward process. And the idea that media organisations with limited resources can moderate these pages um, and effectively take responsibility for um, the commenters of members of the public whilst Facebook um, is in no way liable but is, is remarkable and explaining these technical matters to um, uh, and I don't mean this with any disrespect because I find it challenging to keep up with technology at times. To, to explain this to the courts is incredibly challenging. So that's another example where the law really is behind where it needs to be. Well, where should uh, the responsibility lie in a case where somebody is defamatory or breaches racial discrimination or other guidelines? Um, obviously on a, on a web page that you may host, but you may not be able to moderate it. So, I mean, how, how do we deal with a situation like that? Well, it's a, it's a very good question. I think it's very hard in those circumstances for Facebook to argue that they're just a dumb pipe. Um, I think they need to take some level of responsibility and it's, and it's clear that notwithstanding their technical smarts, they, um, the, the, the challenges for the algorithm in identifying whether it's um, defamatory comments or whether it's misinformation, as we've seen again during COVID-19, where where Facebook's struggling to, to um, quash misinformation that's spreading on its platform. It has to take a greater responsibility for that. And then clearly there is also a responsibility on the individual. We're starting to see situations where individuals are being sued for defamation based on um, uh, posts that they make. And, and, you know, in a world where um, uh, we, we want free speech, that that's risky as well because we a world where we have millions of defamation claims against individuals is challenging, but it certainly shouldn't be exclusively the domain of the publisher who does not have the resources and has limited technical ability to actually moderate those comments. I mean, does that mean, for example, you simply should not be soliciting comments um, if you can't moderate or control them? Yeah, it's a, it's a devil's choice, really. Um, and and we, we certainly looked at that. Um, and to be honest, you know, the Australian in particular probably focuses a little less on um, Facebook um, because it, it historically hasn't been that strong a driver of subscriptions, which is our number one priority. Um, and, um, you know, if, if the laws don't change in, this, in these areas and publishers have to start paying out, you know, um, compensation for comments that are made on social media pages that the publisher isn't responsible for. I think that's where we will end up, frankly. Phil Connie, did you want to come in on this? Well, I just think, you know, there's a very important distinction between material that you publish on your own platform, which you can control, um, and material which is which is published on off platform on a third party platform like a Facebook, for example. Whereas Nicola says you just may not have the ability to take the comments down yourself. Um, so, you know, the, the, those are two very different scenarios. I think the other, for me, the other really important principle in all of this is 
the question of do you have notice of the comments? Uh, you know, the, the, the reason the Vola decision is, is so incredibly uh, hard to accept is that, you know, there's no way that you could ever have anticipated that someone would make those comments under a story that you've posted uh, on a third-party platform that you don't control. Um, you know, the received wisdom is that, for example, when you're on platform and you're controlling your own comments, um, the minute you see the comment, you have to make a decision. Um, but you are in control and, and, and it's only once you have knowledge that you then, you know, make a decision and 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 suffer the consequences one way or the other so um yeah there's a lot to be done i think in this area but george at the very least facebook could just would be hard change their model so that publishers can switch off comments on stories yeah but they refuse. Yep. so again they don't take responsibility uh or something that actually should be quite easy for them to uh to do and you've already mentioned sorry connie Oh, sorry, that was, I think they cite the First Amendment, don't they, Hugh? Yeah, and yeah. They, they refuse to switch off the comments. Yeah, I don't think we've got one of those in Australia, but um, no. <laughs> perhaps we should. Um, yes, that's right. Uh, so I wanted to also ask a, a, one final question because we're coming up to time. Um, we've covered a lot of ground in terms of defamation, national security, COVID-19, freedom of information, lots of different issues that, you know, challenge that idea of freedom of the press. But... I'm just wondering where you think the biggest threat is going to come from in the future uh, in terms of the ability of journalists, media organisations to, you know, tell the public what they need to know. Um, what's, what do you think is the sharpest problem you're likely to face um, over the coming years? Um, anybody want to start? Oh, I mean, I'll, I'll start uh, and um, uh, with a general observation. I think things are now moving so rapidly now. Um, uh, Technology, um, as I mentioned before, it's very hard to keep up with how these things operate. And frankly, even the tech titans themselves can't explain how their own platforms work. Um, uh, and I think this that, that rate of change, um, economic models are rapidly changing and, you know, putting immense pressure on, um, on commercial media organisations. And the regulatory environment is changing rapidly. Uh, or sorry, the political environment is changing rapidly and as a result, the, the regulatory changes that we've alluded to that um, have really started to suppress press freedom. So I think this general rate of change and the unpredictability about um, unintended consequences that it creates as a general point is, is remains a, a big danger for media organisations. And then in particular, that, that's where the economic sustainability you're talking most directly about. And that's where Hugh's point about the mandatory code maybe is so significant. If we actually do get a mandatory code with some revenue sharing and other forms of interaction, which may even go to some of these Facebook concerns that have been mentioned as well, then um, that might deal with some of those. What about you, Hugh? Where, where do you see the sharpest concerns for you? Yeah, well, a lot of this stuff falls into a, a similar category, right, which is how do you make journalists' jobs easier? And the fact is the cost of journalism has skyrocketed. Uh, the defamation laws that people have referred to earlier um, across, you know, Volo, just as well as some of the other judgments and the size of uh, awards that have been made, the cost of doing FOI, the, uh, the, the, the fields or, or you're supposed going to be rated or, you know, all, all of this is making what that fundamental public good, which is the right for people to know, the right for people to have information, that's a public good that needs investment. And uh, the more that we increase the cost of performing that, uh, then the more difficult it becomes. So, so all of this is about making it easier uh, and, and making it appropriately easy with the right checks and balances uh, for journalism to be able to perform that public good of informing the public. And, and it's fundamental. Um, as I said, the HCC, the digital platforms inquiry is, is a good step in that direction, very good, but some of these other things just to make job, people's jobs uh, more productive uh, with the right checks and balances is very important. And, and if we can do that, then the business models that are adjusting, uh, the one that Nicholas referred to, the Australian's model of increasingly relying on subscriptions, the Sydney Morning Herald, the Financial Review, the Age, uh, the same. Um, obviously, television journalism all funded by advertising, but all businesses are responding to this challenge. So if we can just get these changes at the margin, um, then I feel quite confident that, again, the right steps will lead to, you know, a long uh, future of good journalism and, and the public being informed. Thanks, you, Connie. 
Well, I, I, I just would close by saying that there are two things in my mind that are going to be absolutely vital in order for long-form investigative public interest journalism to flourish in this country, and that is adequate protection of whistleblowers uh, in the public interest. Uh, and secondly, I think, you know, our defamation laws uh, are sadly in need of reform. We haven't gone into a lot of the detail, uh, but, you know, one of the key areas uh, is this whole issue around meanings and how meanings are construed. Um, and, you know, there's, a, there's been quite a bit uh, of litigation around that lately. Uh, and if we don't get those two issues right, uh, then I think there, there is a, a real challenge uh, for good long-form investigative journalism in the public interest to continue. Oh, Connie, you should in certainty of voting for the ABC, number three. <laughs> Thank you, Hugh. Good on you, Hugh. <laughs> Look, I've come to time. I've got a few things to say to help us wrap up. But firstly, I'd like to say Connie, Nicholas and Hugh, um, we're really proud to have you as our alumni. Thank you for such a lively discussion. As Dean, I'm pleased to award each of you maximum class participation marks for such a good discussion, <laughs> which I doubt any of you got in your time in our law school. So. Uh, I think we'll, we'll do what we can to retrospectively recognise that. We uh, also, also passed the 80% rule. Yeah, that, you've all turned up as well. So, look, this is very impressive, exactly what we're looking for. You will be an inspiration to our many students who are watching tonight. Um, I'd like to also say thanks to the many hundreds of people who've tuned in tonight. We've really appreciated your support for this experiment. And, uh, you know, we know at a time like this, we've got to keep out there, we've got to communicate. And uh, I'm really glad that people have responded so well to the opportunity to take up uh, the chance to listen to our great team tonight. Uh, one of the people who's been joining us tonight, we're really fortunate, is Peter Grester, the award-winning foreign correspondent. Uh, he's been on the webinar tonight, and uh, many of you will know that Peter is one of our most prominent and forceful advocates for the freedom of journalists. He himself was jailed for terrorism offences in Egypt after covering a political crisis there, and has since helped found the Alliance for Journalists' Freedom, which is one of the most important voices in this debate. And uh, Peter very kindly has agreed to write a wrap-up piece for this discussion, which we'll be sending to everyone who is registered for tonight. And we'll also be sending a recording of the webinar to people. So you can watch this at leisure afterwards. If you're not busy watching the news or Lego Masters, you can come back to this webinar as often as you would like. Um, after you log out tonight, if you've got a few spare minutes, we'd appreciate your feedback. We haven't done this before. So if you've got any thoughts about what worked, what didn't work, how we could do it better, We'd love to hear from you, um, anything you've got to say. But otherwise, just a final thank you from me as the Dean at this law school. It's a pleasure to have held this event tonight. We really thank Connie, Nicholas and Hugh who are so busy and prominent in their own roles for sharing their time and thoughts tonight. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs>